Okay? Thank you all for coming. Um, so, as you know, um, in just a few hours, uh, Barack Obama and Donald Trump uh, will drive together, and uh, Donald Trump will um, be inaugurated uh, as President of the United States. Um, and so we thought we needed to have a reflection about that, in particular the implications uh, given the expertise we have uh, here in Oxford about um, the potential for the potential implications for global governance, both what we know and what we don't know. And there's a lot uh, on both sides that we want to talk about. So we have uh, three distinguished speakers uh, uh, today. We have uh, Professor Calypso Nicolaitis from the uh, Department of uh, Politics and International Relations, who is a professor of international relations here. Uh, Tom Hale, associate professor here of, of public policy. And Emily Jones, also associate professor of um, public policy and director of the Global Economic Governance Program. Um, so we're going to try to keep it um, short and sweet and bring in your questions frequently because we want to hear from you. We think it's an open conversation. Um, we're reflecting on some of those things that, that we can start out with as the basis for conversation and see what we know going forward. But to each of the panelists, um, going from uh, uh, right to left, um, we wa I want to ask first, um, what do we think we know about uh, global governance and international relations going forward? And what do we know that we do not know about what the world will be like under Donald Trump and what can we expect? Um, and with that, so each of you have about five to seven minutes to um, say, say a little bit to get the conversation started. Thanks, Pepper. Thanks, everyone, for welcoming me at the Blavatnik School, being the odd one from the other side of campus. And indeed, what do we know? Very little. And it's impossible to predict the future, isn't it? Or at least there's nothing harder to do. And therefore, I thought, well, Let's try to ask two big questions about issues that matters in international politics or concepts, reciprocity and, ideology and, and uncertainty. So what can we say about the status of those two notions? Uncertainty. Now, you know the old joke you know, about the um, doctor, the architect, and the, um, um, uh, <coughs> Uh, the economists who meet to, to fight about what is the oldest profession. And the doctors say, it's me, you know, uh, Adam was pulled out of uh, uh, the rib, you know. And uh, the architect says, no, 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 it's us. We were before we, we created order of, out of chaos. And then the economist says, but who do you think created chaos in the first place? <laughs> and, and so many people around the world unsurprisingly think, hmm, Trump might be an economist, at least a businessman. And we also know that what's the point of in international diplomacy. Well, it's to deal with, it's, it is to create order out of chaos. It is to deal with the security dilemma where you send the wrong signal by trying to protect each other and there is escalation. It's to deal with the so-called Thucydides traps where you, you're going to react against a rising power. Now, that's the kind of thing we study in IR. You know? And it's all about dealing with uncertainty through diplomacy and communication. Now, I don't think anyone in this room will doubt that the Trump presidency uh, brings somewhat some uncertainty when we deal with tweet temper tantrums, right? Uh, one of my favorite tweets uh, is, is, let it be an arms race. No wonder that if you, you know, Google, as we did with Addis uh, yesterday, if you Google uh, Trump and nuclear button, you get one million uh, hits. Uh, so that's the kind of the public imagination, what's going on here. Uh, and in that, indeed, Doublewitz yesterday uh, described the emerging Trump drug in as FUD, that is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So we have ontological insecurity, as we like to say in the jargon, now with Trump, right? Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, let me suggest that we could at least ask a number of questions. And that's the kind of question I'd love you to ask and us to discuss about, right? First of all, the idea of resilience that checks and balance, not just about Washington, but about the fabric of Western institutions. So isn't there enough resilience in the system? Secondly, the idea that perhaps some form of unmediated diplomacy through tweet-like stuff is not such a bad thing when we know that very often civil society and NGOs, as Tom uh, has researched brilliantly, you know, know better than our elites. Thirdly, balancing. Perhaps this uncertain Trump will give Europe the jolt that it needs to say, we are now the anchor of certainty and stability in the world, right? Who knows? You can dream. Yesterday, Arnaud de Montebourg in Paris said, il faut sublimer l'Europe. So, or fourthly and lastly, 
Uh, and more radically, how about asking about the virtues of uncertainty in international politics? I'll always remember in Greece in the early 80s when Andreas B Papandreou became prime minister, he made a big speech about, you know, when you don't have enough power, your power is uncertainty. It's a surprise you can create. Now, okay, you're going to say, hey, Greece is the fly, you know, the U.S. is the elephant. Johnson said that. So it's not the same thing, uh, of course. But... We could also admit that having no baggage in international politics may be a weakness, but it may be a strength. Um, let's talk Russia. And we also might say, well, normatively, at the systemic le le level, maybe the status quo needs a bit of shaking up. Hey, guys, you know, most of you are young students. Who doesn't think that these days, you know, from Syria to, 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 to Brexit, etc.? Uh, and maybe at the Blavatnik school, you know, uh, uh, you do have a problem with the fact that the elite's favorite girlfriend in the last decades or so has been Tina. There is no alternative. So, so maybe, maybe we're with the Chinese here. You know that they said the other day that on, on thinking of how to deal with Trump, that our thoughts are as diverse as chocolate and poison. So, which brings us to the next topic very quickly, Pepper, reciprocity. Uh, now, you could argue that reciprocity is what, the, what makes the world go around. We need deals in the world, don't we? We need to uplift old deals, WTO, NATO, and we, may, we need to make new deals, Ukraine, Syria, who doubts it? And perhaps more profoundly than that, we live in a world where leaders and peoples are craving respect, with lots of quotes, and the theater of recognition, and this is about deals too. Now, so Trump is our new deal maker, right? Could be good news. The question, of course, is how and qui bono. That's what we always ask in, in IR. And I confess, I haven't read The Art of the Deal. Who's read The Art of the Deal here? The Art of the Deal, though. It should be the international bestseller. Nobody's read The Art of the Deal. <laughs> OK, you haven't. But in my confession, I should say that in a previous life, when I, Pepper and I were at the Kennedy School, I used to teach for my sins negotiation, The Art of the Deal. And you know, there are two things we said that could be relevant. One is. Hey, there are common patterns in negotiations between business, global affairs, and say you're a couple with your kids or your spouse. You know, what's your alternative to agreement? What's the zone of agreement? What is your anchor? And Emily wrote a brilliant book about this one in Asymmetries of Power. Um, there are patterns. And also, if you want to reach the Pareto frontier, the positive, positive sum deals, you know, this kind of thing you study in class, uh, you have to think outside the box. It's got to be, you know, different. So maybe there are things to, to be said for, deal, for, for Trump. And you read titles like, can there be a Trump unorthodox deal on X, Libya or Syria? You know, the unorthodox deal. Maybe there's a promise. So let me say that then we, in our conversation, we need to discuss the features of reciprocity, or what I would call desirable reciprocity. Three desirable reciprocity, and I'll finish on that. One is restrained reciprocity. That, you know, you, you, you go tit for tat in the world, but with restraint. In fact, common sense and game theory will tell you that better than tit for tat is tit for two tat. I pause before I reciprocate. Can he do that? You tell me, you know. I'm just asking the question. Secondly, Trump has said a lot of things about asymmetric deals, redressing the asymmetry in our deals with China, developing countries, NATO, currency, unfair taxation, all of this stuff. We'll talk about this. Uh, but of course, we, the question then, the deal, is who defines what's asymmetric? If you have a world where hey, China buys U.S. debt and U.S. buys Chinese goods. That's a deal. I don't think it's that asymmetric, especially when every second we think, you know, the debt might kind of blow up in pieces. So that's a deal. But who defines the symmetry of the deal, right? Um, and we could discuss about uh, lots of examples in trade, but I know Emily is going to talk about trade. So, but let me just point out that what matters in defining together what's symmetric, what could, how a deal can be rethought, is trust. And part of the problem that we have today that we are facing is a great and dangerous convergence between geoeconomics and geopolitics. China and the South China Sea versus trade illustrates the point. And when you don't have trust, it's very hard together to sit down and define what is it about the asymmetry or symmetry of this deal. And finally, Desirable reciprocity, thirdly, 
we've learned, you know, in the last decade, that's called the post-war order, that we have diffuse reciprocity rather than direct reciprocity, meaning making linkages, meaning trading the long term for the short term and vice versa, meaning having deals across many countries, some benefit more or less, and it all comes out equal in the end. And there the question is, uh, you know, this is what international organizations do for us. And yes, Trump and his administrations are not likely to, to leave WTO or NATO. We can have a conversation about this. But he lives in a world of bilateral deals. And not, it was never better illustrated for European than when he said, and somebody from his future administration, that, hey, Europeans, you know, you want to do like Britain? We're already... We, we are ready with our bilateral deals. You know, go bilateral, guys, because then we can deal with you more easily. Um, so, you know, you have to ask, well, how does that square with dreams of inclusive globalization and manage uh, justice in the world? That's the question we want to ask. So to conclude, it would be great to take our inspiration from no drama Obama. Love him. Uh, keep calm and hope that Trump will manage to truly surprise us in some sort of good way. But I knew I would not bet on it. Uh, then again, there's nothing harder to predict than the future, uh, especially when it's called Trump. Okay, great. Thank you, Calypso. So um, the world we're moving from is a dreams of my father to the art of the deal. Um, and it, it leaves us breathless with excitement. Tom, you want to follow up on the implications of uncertainty? Yeah, I also wanted to talk about uncertainty because Pepper's question was what we know and what we don't know. And what we definitely know is there will be a lot more we don't know in the, in the future. Um, but what I think is I want to emphasize uh, first is this kind of sources of that uncertainty, because it's not just about tweets. It's actually much deeper than that, and therefore much more worrisome in many ways. Um, I think there are really four major sources of uncertainty about what the United States' policy will be over the next four years. Um, the first one is, is just the fact that Trump has selected a cabinet and a national security team, <laughs> to the extent he selected them, yet. Um, that's far more diverse, has much more diverse views on the role of the United States in the world than, uh, than I think in a long time. And you can identify kind of four schools of thought um, amongst the Trumpians um, who often disagree with each other. So the first school is probably what you might call the holy warriors. These are people like Steve Bannon who believe that there is an existential struggle between um, Western societies and other parts of the world, so the clash of civilizations hypothesis. And these people really think there's some sort of important civilizational contest taking place um, in the world, but also within Western democracies. Um, and that's uh, manifested in various appeals to white nationalism, in various sort of Islamophobic um, domestic policies, but also into activist foreign policy, and especially in the realm of, um, of uh, counterterrorism. Um, and, and inclines them to see certain established powers in different ways, especially uh, Russia, who they see as an ally in the fight against Islamic extremism. A Christian ally, I should say, because these kind of identities matter for this, this group of foreign policy um, activists. A second group is one you'll be familiar with from the Bush administration, the neoconservatives. You have people like John Bolton who represent this view, people who think actually the United States has a very important role in the world as... Um, as a force for, um, for liberalism, and broadly defined, um, and for imposing sort of American foreign policy priorities on other countries through the muscular exercise of military power. Um, and those people, you know, in theory, Trump ran against them, but a bunch of them are now popping up back in his administration. So that's definitely a voice to be reckoned with as well. The third is what you might call the isolationists. These are the inward-looking parts of the Republican Party that are, are not particularly focused on the role of the United States in the world, who don't think there should be much of a role. Um, you've had people like Ted Cruz introduced a bill uh, last week about defunding all American funding to the United Nations uh, ever, for um, permanently. So these people just think that there should be no kind of engagement abroad. And fourth and last, you have some actual bona fide establishment Republicans who um, are part of the post-war sort of American foreign policy consensus that more or less is supportive of NATO and uh, basic kind of institutions in world, in, in world order. So all the four of those people hate each other's guts, and they're not going to work well together. Um, and of course, all, you know, all administrations have some diversity of views. Certainly, the Obama administration had uh, significant divergence of views within various parts of its foreign policy. But my contention to you is that these people's views aren't just kind of nuances on this uh, theme. They're actually fundamentally different ways of seeing the world. 
and that's going to generate a lot of conflict. And for any given issue, we're not going to know necessarily who's going to get the upper hand. So the second source of this uncertainty, though, is actually the bureaucratic procedures, which are de usually dedicated to solving those kinds of dilemmas. Um, and uh, traditionally, in, in American foreign policy making, this happens through the National Security Council, which is the White House-based uh, sort of security apparatus that is supposed to run interagency processes that get people from the State Department, the Department of Defense, the military, um, all these to get together and kind of come up with some sort of common policy and to hash out those differences before it goes to the president or other uh, principles for decisions. Um, and I think you'll probably have read in the news that Trump has appointed a very um, uh, poor manager, I guess we one way of putting it, to lead the National Security Council, Mr. Flynn, who when he was the head of, uh, of uh, intelligence was sort of known for making up facts and, and sort of being a very bad manager, um, which is basically the National Security um, Advisor's principal role is to kind of get these kind of bureaucratic procedures to, to run and to queue up decisions for, for the president. So that doesn't bode well in our kind of bureaucratic ability to solve those, those kind of tensions. Third factor, um, usually other parts of the government can serve as a constraint on this kind of, and kind of force decisions um, on the executive, especially in matters where Congress has to weigh in. So in the past, people could depend on Congress to have a certain stance on trade deals, which would constrain executive action, or a certain stance on different kinds of military interventions, which less and less, but still could constrain different kinds of uh, military actions or, or foreign policy trade-making deals, for example. Um, but that's just not necessarily can be taken for granted anymore. We have a Congress which I don't think knows which way it wants to go on many of these questions yet because it hasn't yet found the sort of uh, center of gravity that it's searching for. And so it can't be relied upon to um, help unify uh, this incoherent mess. And finally, of course, you have a very mercurial incoming president who uh, may make a policy on Twitter in the morning and then leave it to his divided team to make into an actual policy uh, in the afternoon. So. That's a kind of deep structural set of reasons why we're going to have uncertainty going forward. Um, so let me just conclude then by talking about the implications of that uncertainty. I think Calypso, you did a great job of highlighting uh, many of these. Um, but I just would add that you know, uncertainty is, um, undermines two important aspects of foreign policy making. The first is the ability to make credible commitments, another piece of international relations jargon we, we think about quite a lot. Um, is if you want to ex exercise long-term influence on someone, you have to be able to compel them uh, with credible agreements what you're going to do. Say, I'm not going to sanction you if you do this, or I will sanction you if you cross this red line, or whatnot. Um, and if you lose your reputation, your ability to make that kind of commitment, you actually then have to actually compel them through the use of force, say, or through some kind of sanctions. You can't just give them the threat. And that's too costly. You can't afford in foreign policy to actually follow through on all your threats. You just have to create the idea that you'll follow through on your threats or your promises. Um, and if you don't have any kind of guarantee, if you can't actually make that credible commitment because your domestic political process doesn't allow you to come to a coherent policy, then you lose power. You lose influence. You know, Trump has this idea that, um, kind of going back to your idea of diffuse reciprocity clip, so that in a transactional world, in any given deal, you can become more powerful by being the crazy one, right? If they don't know what you're going to do, if you might be something totally outrageous, then you're going to have more of a, a hand in bargaining. And that's certainly true in a kind of transactional sense, right? A one-off deal. But if you're trying to, over time, create a sort of institutions of diffuse reciprocity, um, you don't want to be crazy. You want to be, have a reputation of following through on your deals, because that's the thing that actually gets people to make concessions over the long term and to hold them. So that's going to weaken the United States' ability in foreign policy to get what it wants from others, this sort of domestic uncertainty. Um, the one thing, and let me end with this, that we, uh, we don't know yet, but that um, I think we'll be very keen to learn, is will this change over time? Will the administration learn the lessons of mm -hmm. that this uncertainty is costing it and, um, you know, say, replace Flynn as a national security advisor or, or whatnot and kind of find some ways to... Uh, come to more coherence. Plenty of administrations start out um, in a different spot than where they end up, so it's not unlikely that this, some kind of learning process will occur. Um, however, we just certainly can't take it for granted. And indeed, I think we'll see lots of examples where the domestic weakness of the Trump administration, remember they're starting off with a much lower approval rating than ever before. It might be strength, but it might be weakness, will actually make them much more um, eager to use foreign policy as a distraction, as a tool for um, defle deflecting attention from other domestic concerns, 
and therefore actually undermine the learning process. So I'm not particularly optimistic, but that's one thing we'll certainly want to figure out going forward. Great. Thank you, Tom. So from both Calypso and Tom, um, two uh, eminent scholars of uh, multilateral cooperation, um, we see a view that uh, looks at, at, at times pessimistic and at times um, reflects negatively on, on the, the prospects for the United States. Um, now, probably um, a, a Trump uh, view of foreign policy would say these are, in fact, sources of strength. And I just want to put that on the table, that um, they would say being uncertain, being unpredictable, not being uh, involved in these, you know, these institutions controlled by elites uh, where you make credible commitments is actually a strength, not a weakness. Uh, and so I think we should keep both those views in mind as we're thinking about you know, what this actually means going forward. Um, but the biggest confrontation that Trump had, at least in his presidential campaign, with the institutions of international governance was in the area of trade. Uh, and I know Emily Jones has thought a lot about this. Is going to share a few thoughts with us. Yeah, thank you very much, Pepe. So I wanted to sort of think about what we do know about Trump and trade and then what we don't know. And I think what we don't know is, is necessarily how things are going to pan out. But I, there's quite a lot we do know. We do know what the campaign uh, trail pledges that he made. We know he has a vision of the world trade as zero sum. Um, that basically exports good, imports bad, um, so quite a mercantilist vision. He's very concerned about creating jobs in the Rust Belt um, and those who've lost out from um, trade deals. So he's got a real emphasis on creating jobs for that, that group and a real deep belief that Calypso has mentioned that existing trade deals don't serve America. Now, if you've looked from any other country's perspective in the world, you're going to question that. Um, those deals have been asymmetric, often in America's <coughs> interests. But I think the important point to remember is that very specific groups within the US have gained from those trade deals, and it's not the Rust Belt. So actually, this is about asymmetrical distribution within the US, and it's a reconfiguration of politics. And he's playing, of course, to those who've lost out from those, those trade deals. Um, we've got a very clear signal that he will make these kind of protectionist moves. He's put trade hawks in the three key um, positions on trade. And actually, they've got quite a coherent view from what I understand. I'm not a student of US politics, so I stand to be corrected. Um, but my understanding is on trade, they've got a real America first trade policy, and it's pretty clear. Um, so there's the US trade representative. He's created a new head of uh, the national, he's created a new body, the National Trade Council in the White House. And he's heading it um, with Navarro, who wrote this book, Death by China. Right? This is not a guy who believes in cooperation or a positive sum from uh, from trade, and his Secretary of Commerce is very much on board with that. So actually, I think there's quite a lot of consistency about the administrative, administrative the key people's sort of vision of what trade should look like. Um, what can Trump do? And yes, checks and balances in other areas, but not in trade. And that's actually quite an important one. So in terms of the Constitution, from what I understand, is that the Constitution says that Congress has power over trade and commerce. But over the years, we've seen a ceding of that authority by Congress to the president. So we've got a series of um, acts that have been passed since the 1930s, I understand, that give him quite a lot of power. Okay, so he's actually got a lot of power in the area of trade. Um, he can't, his, a new trade deal, like the TPP, requires congressional approval. Okay, undoing it does not. Okay, and he's got a lot of um, ability to, by executive fiat, invoke some of these acts to impose tariffs. So he's got quite a lot of room that he, and with the backup of this sort of quite strong set of beliefs amongst his key players, um, can do. Um, could Congress block it? Well, yes, they could require that authority to come back to Congress and, and sort of take back some of the control from the presidency, but they need a two-thirds majority to do that. So it's not clear that actually um, that he's that con unconstrained either because of divisions within his administration or by Congress in the area of trade. So then I think it's helpful to think through some of the things he might do. Number one, rip up the TPP. Well, hey, that's easy. Right? TPP has been signed. It's not been implemented. It's a nice symbolic action he can take without that many repercussions. Question is then what happens is you leave the door open for China, which has had a rival trade deal, um, which it's been pursuing. And of course, it, it opens that, uh, that window up. But I think we are going to see him symbolically rip up the TPP. He's talked a lot about targeting specific countries, right? So Mexico and China, we keep hearing about, you know, that's the source of the losses of jobs, right? So China is undercutting the steel industry. Mexico is undercutting all the automobile sectors. So that's his sort of top two headline countries he's singled out. Um, he's threatened all these border, um, these taxes. So what could, what could he do with regards to Mexico? He could reopen <laughs> NAFTA, but to what end? Okay, it's not actually clear why, what exactly he'd be trying to renegotiate in NAFTA. He could rip up NAFTA, um, which he, he could do, but it's quite interesting if you read the repercussions of that. Um, the tariffs wouldn't go up that much. 
right? So actually, it's, I'm not sure that, it, yes, you get a symbolic um, move, but tariffs on most goods under NAFTA, are, or, so without NAFTA, aren't that high um, anyway. So I think there's a real question there of whether that delivers on what he, he wants to do. He could unilaterally raise tariffs. He can't do it on specific um, car manufacturers from Mexico, but he could do it on all car, car imports from Mexico. But then we've got to think about how Mexico is going to retaliate. Okay, and this is the problem here is that we're in a world of global value chains. Okay, so car manufacturers, Mexico is incredibly dependent on the US for its export of cars, but where did the parts come from? 40% of, of, the, of the parts that are in a Mexican car exported to the US come from the US. Okay, so the moment that he makes a move there, Mexico is then going to start blocking the automobile sector, which is going to hit the same people employed in the same sectors he's worried about. So it's not clear to me that as soon as he, if he goes down that track, Mexico retaliates, it hurts Mexico, but it also has significant repercussions in the US. So the politics to me is not actually that clear once you start following through the sort of tit for tat um, logic. Turning briefly to China, um, here I think the obvious thing he can do is continue Obama's policies, but shout about it. Okay, so relatively few of us have sort of realized quite how many cases the U.S. Has, has brought at the WTO against China, 17 under the Obama administration. Um, that's included a 35% tariff on um, Chinese tires in 2009, right? So a whole series of things they've already been doing vis-a-vis um, -vis China. Steel imports from China have already fallen 70% 70 um, in the last year. Right, so actually Obama's been doing a lot, he just hasn't been really aggressively shouting about it on the global stage. If I'm in Trump's book, definitely I'll sort of shout about what, it, what is already um, happening. That's an easy win. Currency manipulator. That's another thing he said he's gonna accuse China um, of and sort of lodge a case at WTO. That's a hard one, because if anyone's followed China, they've been propping up their currency. Um, sorry, they've been, uh, yeah. Um, they've been trying to stop it sliding, not propping it up um, in the recent times. So actually, it's not clear that that's an obvious route he can easily go down. He can hike tariffs. So under that presidential fiat, we could see a 45% um, tariff on Chinese uh, imports, say, of steel or um, other things. What will China how will China respond? So far, they've played it very cool. We saw the Davos speech um, by President Xi this um, week, sort of trumping, sort of stating openness. But if I'm in China's shoes, what are the levers I've got? Cancel contracts with Boeing, okay? Disrupt the iPhone chain, which actually hurts the US quite significantly, and block car imports, right? General Motors exports more cars to China than it does to the domestic market in the US, okay? So again, the same people he's trying to save the jobs of are gonna get hurt as soon as China starts to retaliate. So it's not clear to me that actually that serves his own um, purpose. And just one thing to just mention is what the Republican Party is then trying to do to sort of ward off a trade war. And that's this border tax adjustment policy. So what they've brought to the Congress is to say, actually, let's have a new tariff on all um, imports. And Trump said that's too complicated, but I think what they're trying to do is say, let's have a general policy that affects all countries that doesn't get us into a logic of tit-to-tat um, war. Um, there are serious problems with that policy, and I'm happy to talk more about it, but I think will it fly politically is a real question. Who does it hurt? Well, all those who import in the retail sector. So Walmart is already up in arms. So I'm not sure, again, it's going to fly politically, and he needs congressional authority to pass it because it's tax legislation, not commerce. Um, so to conclude, definitely we're seeing a protectionist turn rhetorically. But I think as soon as you start to kind of think through the logic of then what he can do, and what the repercussions are going to be, that's not necessarily that easy um, in terms of the domestic politics, and particularly creating jobs in the Rust Belt. Right? That's not going to bring back jobs. And I think once we then, then my concern is, well, maybe he's going to settle for the symbolic moves. Maybe he's just going to rip up TPP and be happy. If he's not, and he goes down this kind of tit for tat, doesn't deliver on jobs, I think the concern then, and this is the real unknown, how will he respond? And I think then we could get into some quite nasty populist moves on immigrants and some of the other things that he can deliver on because trade is not going to deliver those jobs in, in sort of where he needs it in the Midwest. Okay, so um, I'm going to open this up for, for a couple of questions, but let me put provocative summaries of, of what we've heard. Uh, Emily has just told us that um, very anti-trade uh, Trump is going to run into a lot of uh, barriers in trying to do anything more than symbolism. And so implications for global governance, 
Maybe not very much. Tom has told us that we have a bunch of incompetent managers who don't agree with each other in the national security apparatus. So implications for global governance, we're going to look bad, uh, the United States, that is. Um, but, it's, but it's not clear what the difference to the global architecture will be. And Calypso has sort of tantalizingly uh, put before us the notion that um, Trump is someone who prefers um, the bilateral uh, negotiation, and, the, and, 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 and that is part of his art of the deal mentality. But he's got a, a lot of um, problems in terms of his practice of reciprocity in, ter in terms of trying to get there. Um, and so I think the broad view that may emerge from these interventions is um, if you're in global governance, it's probably going to be bad optics, but things are going to be fine. Um, so some of you may disagree with that. The panelists may disagree with that. Um, but I want to open up the discussion on that note. Question back there. I'll take three in this round. Please state your name briefly Thanks. and your question. Briefly. Al yes. Hamazia, uh, thank you very much for the um, uh, to the panelists. Uh, a quick question for Emily. I was hoping you could say a little bit about energy policy going forward in the U.S. Um, with the proposed lift or the lifting of, of uh, oil exports, and uh, with the Secretary of State who's probably more uh, capable on U.S. On the, on the energy secretary side. And for Calypso, I was hoping you could maybe comment on the ramifications of um, relegating human rights and many democratic principles on U.S. soft power going forward. Thank you. Okay. Right here, up in the front. Transatlantic solidarity and common values, and I don't know whether Calypso can help us in defining what holds the transatlantic alliance together. Obviously, it's not embracing free trade. It is not a unified view on Russia as the enemy. It is not environmentalism. It is not... Calypso, can you help me which values hold it together? And if there isn't much, what are the consequences? Uh, Theresa May had one answer for that question. Yes. There's a question in the back there, though. Uh. Hi, I guess it's a question for Emily. You mentioned the internal asymmetries of the trade tariffs and so on that Trump was talking about. But it seems to be that a lot of his cabinet and of his sort of inner and even outer circle have been benefiting from those. So how is he going to reconcile the discrepancy between his rhetoric and the interest group that he represents and claims to represent? Okay, let's, let's turn it back to the panel and give them a chance to um, respond. Why don't we go this way this time? Emily, you want to start? Yeah, sure. I'm actually going to, the question on energy policy I'm going to give to Tom because he's worked extensively on climate change and I know he's thought a lot about that. Um, I'm going to come back on the transatlantic solidarity and I'm going to come back on this interest group one. And I think on the transatlantic solidarity, um, there's one vision that I think the UK government hard Brexiteers have about what might hold us together with the Trump administration, which is a new deal, right? The new UK-US deal that's all around a light touch regulatory state. I mean, it's, this is my, my big fear at the moment is that there's a part of the UK government that would love us to go down um, this route and will want to deal at any cost with the US. Um, that's, so we'll look to Eclipso for the more optimistic vision, but I think um, if we're going to do a deal as the UK is hoping to with the US, it will be on the US's terms. Um, and there's going to be a lot of compromising actually for the UK um, in that context. So um, it's, it's one to watch, but it's going to be, that will be a tough negotiation. Um, but I think you've, you've raised a really important question there on the asymmetries within the US. And we've got a lot of billionaires. We've got a lot of Wall Street and Goldman Sachs in his, in his inner circle. Um, and I think that's a really important question. And I think part of where his trade policy will face a lot of opposition is precisely from, from that group. Um, and it's unclear exactly how that's going to play out. Because again, the Republicans in Congress come from, from, that, from that group as well. They're not among his three. That particular mindset is not among his three trade hawks. Um, and he's got a lot of power on his own, but he could see a lot of pushback, I guess, politically from within his cabinet um, and from Wall Street if he's going down this agenda, from Big Pharma, from the big export companies that have gained enormously from the type of deals that, that, that the U.S. has done over the years. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really important source of constraint um, that we might see. Tom. On the energy issue, so I think uh, we will see, uh, the, I mean, the United States has been on a trajectory to increase energy exports for a long time, and that will continue, uh, certainly. Um, I don't think that that's so much a Trump thing, as sort of a long-term technologically driven trend in, in many ways. Um, I'll, I'll come back maybe later to the larger issue of climate change if we have a chance to discuss that. But um, on, on the oil exports thing, I think that'll definitely be, be the case. Um, 
I wanted to address your question, Pepper, about uh, whether this all adds up to a problem or not. Um, and yeah, maybe actually a, a deactivist, a kind of less functional US foreign policy in some interpretations would be good, or maybe not as bad as it might be feared. But I think I want to make the case that um, actually global governance today is not sort of in a happy equilibrium where it's sort of chugging along, tentatively it needs to be left alone. It's actually unfit for purpose. It's in a failing in many ways, where it's not being able to provide the kind of coordination and coherence that we need to manage problems that affect each of our lives, such as the risk of another financial crisis, such as the risk of a huge pandemic disease, such as the risk of climate change, such as the risk of deadly terrorist groups, such as the risk of nuclear war. Um, these are all things that we need effective global governance for, and our current systems are not delivering on it, are not able to deliver on it. And so an activist uh, pro-global governance foreign policy from the United States and other large powers, I think, is sort of a necessary condition for mm -hmm. avoiding those challenges. To have even a disinterested um, U.S. foreign policy, which I think is probably the best case scenario under Trump, is, I think, in, for global governance, kind of a disaster. So, Calypso. So, in a, in a way, there is a tension here uh, between, and, and to pick up on the human rights question, but more generally, between a world where we kind of fear that a single, the capture by, of a government or of an institution by a single strong man or a few you know, can make a huge difference through discourse, through actions, through the kind of uncertainty we were talking about, but also through the kind of model that you're, the, the message you're sending to the world that being a Chavez, being an Erdogan, being a Putin, being a strong man is kind of okay. In fact, it really works. And in fact, it really works in the most powerful country in the world, still most powerful. What kind of signal is that sending to the world? You know, a strong man, and I use the word strong man, simply to say at least the kind of, let, let's not even say populist, the kind of power where it's okay to centralize the levers of power, albeit with as Tom described so well, you know, a very kind of fragmented underpinning. And that's true also in, the, in these other countries. But so that's kind of the atmospherics of this new kind of strongman leadership that will then authorize all sorts of things, that, all sorts of arbitrary things, including on human rights. But, because the point is not that we can predict, oh, hum, uh, Trump will keep Guantanamo Bay or whatever, is that he'll kind of, there is a sense that he'll, what principles will guide the action? And that's the point about strongman. But at the other end of that same spectrum uh, of, of agency in the world, we also believe, don't we, Tom, that agency is no longer just in governments. And, and you work on that when, on, when it comes to the environment. That change in the world is happening, will happen more and more, thanks to civil society, NGOs, corporations that do the right thing, you know, not all of them, et cetera. Um, and in fact, private sector incentives. So from what I know on environment, for instance, I've been told that whatever Trump wants to do and be an environmental climate change denier, you know, the, the decisions by energy consortia are long term, 15, 20 years. And they'll do what makes sense. And what makes sense is to invest in new energy. So, so you've got this kind of bottom up governance that, and let's not be stereo and naive, but let's consider that too. Um, and so to, to, to Hartmut's question about transatlantic solidarity, you know, uh, well, first of all, we could say that it's been shaken for a long time. But, uh, and yes, all of us in this room would want reason for, reasons for, you know, hope, or what are we hanging on to? And of course, if you're a hardcore, you know, IR realist, you kind of believe in converging interests. And who was saying this? Uh, one of you was, you know, at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, there are some common interests, and we are, at, and these will be maybe need to be rediscovered. But that's kind of what we can count on. Now, of course, we Give have we have the the four types of people by Tom who will have different answers to one or two. Um, and I would, um, but I would say, if I'm going to give you a couple. Very importantly for all of us here in this room, there is not one Europe, is there, Hartmut? You know, when you say Europe, which Europe? And there, will, there might be a bit of Europe that is not always unhappy. So for instance, take Syria. You know, we're having the, the, the big debate with Russia 
is whether or not the settlement will, will make it look like the West was able to do regime change, like it did in Libya and obviously in Iraq. And that is Putin's red line. Now, France doesn't want to move on that. France wants Assad out. But Germany is not that sure. Germany's like, well, we could leave Assad for a little while so that it doesn't look like, like regime change in Syria. That, that's what we've done, and Putin will be happy. So when Trump wants to make Putin happy, he might have some partners in Europe who are more ready than others to go in his direction. And we could have other examples on that. But that, the point is, these are not monolithic you know, negotiations. And, you know, similarly on how to deal with ISIS and uh, public enemy number one, you could say that's a common interest. Well, not enough to say that. How do you deal with ISIS? And how do you deal with the equation of refugees, with terrorists? Yes, huge differences there, obviously. Nevertheless, you know, if there are some successes, you will see some convergence. Uh, but I do want to say one word about Britain and to follow up on what, on what Emily was saying. One of the fascinating triangle that we will observe here, I think, in asking, you know, what connects us with, with the, what could connect us with Trump? Well, of course, it's, it's Britain. Britain is an island in the middle of the Atlantic, don't you know? Uh, well, but then how can Theresa May want still to have the golden relationship with China? Let in, and now we're going to have our special deal with China. And since we're not as, as kind of bloody minded as the EU, we'll have you know, very low tariffs with China. But we want to have a deal with Trump, who wants to raise tariffs with China. And Trump's going to say, well, am I going to import from Britain you know, the parts from China that I've refused to import through Mexico or whatever? You're going to have fascinating tr trade deal chains there. And I think Theresa May, however brilliant she might be, uh, might not be able to figure that one out so easily, that triangle. I want to push uh, the panel on a, a part of global governance that we've talked less about, Calypso, you said a little bit, and that is alliance structure uh, and geopolitics. Uh, and I'd like you to think about how quickly things can change and, um, you know, what might push them to change. Is it events, dear boy, events, or is it a sort of gradual evolution of what will happen? And we should talk about the, the possible alliance structure in Europe, which was already mentioned uh, by Calypso. Um, and, you know, how, how does this, you know, one way of thinking about the relationship between the United States and Europe is that uh, we've had this before. It was called, well, we separated into old Europe and new Europe, uh, right? And so the United States tries to pull apart by, by going for new Europe. Um, and, and the UK would be a welcome member of New Europe, probably from the US perspective. Second is the question of what goes on uh, in Asia, which is creates a, a, a number of uh, new possibilities, in t including an American nuclear doctrine, um, which had been uh, announced during the campaign with various levels of seriousness. Um, so, so what might we expect there? Um, and uh, Asia raises the question of, you know, there is uh, another rising power uh, in, uh, that could take the place of the United States, at least some say so. Um, and it, Xi's in Davos uh, this week, uh, and certainly Trump is not in Davos, uh, and not just geographically, but uh, physically, spiritually, he's not there. Um, and so what, what, what role for China? And finally, of course, uh, the question that uh, a lot of Americans like to talk about is the new relationship with Russia. Um, and what does that mean for these alliance structures? So I'd like to invite each of you to reflect on a, a part of this puzzle that you think you can, you can get a, a purchase on. Calypso. Gosh, um, I'm still taking okay, It's not okay. fair. You're still no, taking notes. No, 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 no okay. it's okay. I mean, let me just uh, pick up on your G's in Davos. That, and we've all picked up on that irony that he's in Davos to defend the creature of the U.S., the WTO, 94. This, the U.S. put all its energy in creating this World Trade Organization, uh, and now G is saying, this is our baby, our new baby, our adopted baby, whatever metaphor you want. We've and, relaxed the one-child <laughs> policy, and so we're taking it on. And then, there you go. It works. And, um, and it's credible because of what Emily said on, in her initial presentation. When... Uh, when, when, when Trump says, um, uh, you know, we will raise tariffs, border tariffs, or whatever, Section 301, start a game, you know, uh, under WTO, you can, uh, well, you could go and retaliate and then argue that this was a fair retaliation. But the whole WTO 
thing is about managing retaliation, allowing you to, to be reciprocal but managing it, right? Well, and, but China is going to be more legal than you know, any trade lawyer in the US going to say, we're going to go through the dispute settlement of WTO, we're going to give it to the judges. You know, it's going to play by the book, by the rules of the game, and there is not, the US could say, OK, we get out of WTO, but it's not going to do that. Um, so that one of the things, that one of the learning process we're going to see is the game of, of China defending through these, these complex re dispute resolution stuff, you know, the institutions. And what will the Trump administration uh, respond? Either it's the, your isolationist, they'll say, well, we retreat from the organization, or it's your legitimists. Or, I mean, and we'll, we'll see who wins out, and that's very hard. But on the nuclear um, uh, uh, doctrine, um, I think that you know you talk about change, and we when we hear change, it's a good thing, right? Uh, to some extent, or it could get better. But what about abrupt change? I mean, one of the things that really worries me, back to threats and and the nuclear button, is is North Korea and the Northeast uh, Asia situation. Um, what what game is China going to play with North Korea? Is there? And you could see it could go both ways. It could become very, very bad. I mean, Trump has used very different language from the Obama administration on that. Or, you know, it could force a, a, a new wave of nuclear uh, negotiations because there's been other talks of, uh, of nuclear negotiations, of non-proliferation negotiation. In particular, if you link this to, to the new relationship with Russia, you know, if Russia sees that... Um, it is getting something from this ga new game. Uh, it is get getting the recognition that it craves, the respect. I mean, after all, if Putin wants something, it's that kind of respect. We acknowledge you're a great power. Trump has given it to him. Now, we can all ask for what price, you know, will, will he be able to put Ukraine in his pocket? Uh, and that's a question. But it could also be that some sort of new conversation is had on the nuclear non-proliferation front in exchange for that respect. Because after all, even the nuclear game itself is a game of mutual respect or lack of respect or denial of respect. It's all about status. It's all about, it's all a macho game. Hey, women in this room, you know, who's, <laughs> who's the biggest guy in town? So that's a different game and we might see some very new surprising developments. Okay, Tom? Um, just to pick up on the North Korea point, I think it's very likely that there will see um, a effort by North Korea to test the waters for the Trump administration, maybe today, maybe next week, maybe soon. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of news reports to that effect. Um, I think there's a very narrow window of circumstances where one of Calypso's uh, ideas about a kind of fortuitous turn of events might happen where the kind of a threat of a North Korean um, move that then provokes a U.S. overreaction is actually sufficiently worrisome to China to get China to do something more proactive on North Korea than it's done in the past and therefore to break, make some kind of breakthrough. However, that's a very precise code of calculation. A lot of things need to happen in the right sequence, the right way. More likely, I would say, is that that um, event actually spirals beyond the control of any of these organizations. So I think it's quite worrisome. And it has implications for how we think about the alliance structure in Asia, um, to your point, Pepper. Um, because... Uh, you know, Trump has clearly made no uh, doubts about his view that alliances should be questioned, but um, he's also made very clear that China is the thing he wants to confront, and those two are not really compatible. If you want to conf confront China, you need to strengthen your alliances with other countries in Asia, and if you want to reduce your alliances in Asia, you'll strengthen China. So that's a choice he'll have to make, or his apparatus will have to make. <coughs> My guess, given the balance of, um, this is guess, is that the threat of China will be more important than getting a fair deal from allies. So we'll actually see more of a pivot to Asia in some ways than we did under um, even Obama for this reason. Um, but not a TPP kind of pivot, um, because that would cross the domestic threshold, um, kind of interfere too much with his anti-trade agenda. It's too obvious kind of a thing to do. Um, so if there's no other way to confront China and build alliances in the Asia you know, with the TPP route, it'll be increased military cooperation in the South China Sea. It'll be um, talking to Taiwan. It'll be increased kind of um, military cooperation with Japan. A kind of new, you know, there's worrisome trends that could be stoked in Japan on, on the sort of um, nationalist front. So will it be we're going to blockade those islands? 
Uh, yeah. How far how far will the U.S. go on the well, South China Sea? I don't know, but people have said that, you know, Tillerson said he could imagine blockading those islands. And so this is a, a, the exact kind of thing where you have a crisis that uh, ends up with a result that no one wanted initially. It's a classic case of a security dilemma getting out of control. So I think that's uh, that's a very worrisome situation. Right. Emily. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, just to add two <laughs> short points on that, I think within the Asia constellation of alliances, there's a real question there of Japan. Um, President Abe put all his political capital in getting the TPP ratified. Um, and he's very upset with the U.S. He was the first person to get on a plane and quickly go to see um, Trump. Um, so I think he needs to do something vis-a-vis -vis Japan. And what was really interesting when he went was this kind of murmuring that might be, they do do bilateral deals. They were very quick to say, we don't do multilateral deals, TPP's out, but actually we do this bilateral deal making. So it'll be interesting to see whether they can find any kind of settlement there in the economic realm um, with Japan. But I think he definitely needs to, um, if, if he's going to have an ally there, Japan's quite important. Um, on the U.S.-Europe point, I've been actually looking at this recently on the U from the UK's perspective in, in the context of Brexit. Um, and we need to deal with the EU, right? Um, and my concern is the more we, war we cozy up to the US, the harder it is to get gonna be to get a deal with the EU. And I think the UK government's gonna realize that pretty quickly. Um, already we've seen us sort of, we've been goading the EU um, and we've now got Trump also goading. Um, the EU and questioning its integrity. So I think the logical next move is going to be the, the UK is going to have to distance itself from Trump at some point if it wants a deal uh, with Europe. Um, so I, the UK, yes, is quite pivotal on this, but I think the UK, out of its own self-interest to preserve a deal with the, the EU, um, actually is going to back off if it's got any sense. And we might need to rein in Boris Johnson, but um, from a point of view of the, the UK's interest, that's, that's, I think, where we'll go, is to uh, pu pull ourselves towards Europe, because actually, with Trump in power in the US, that's our natural alliance. So that it could be an interesting time, actually, for the UK-EU relationship, um, and how Trump and plays into it. Let's not forget the numbers. The US is 14% of UK trade. The EU is almost 50%. Half. Yeah. So different numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Can I add a point on TPP, though? If you, uh, you have a fellow here, I don't know if he's in the room, or from Vietnam. Yeah, he is. Done. <laughs> Hello, how are you? And he told me fascinating stories about how TPP was negotiated. Well, you could speak better than me about it, but uh, how the TPP negotiation were able to extract from Viet Vietnam mm. some independence of trade unions, labor unions, uh, labor rights. And so... You know, one of the questions is mm -hmm. the kind of deals that were made around TPP and concessions that were had and, and kind of socializations of countries like Vietnam in the system. You know, what, what happens to that? Mm -hmm. now? But the counter to that, and we shouldn't forget that, you know, when we go after Trump, is that there is a, a kind of progressive critique of globalization mm -hmm. and of these deals. Uh, let's not forget that these kinds of deals, TPP and TTIP, we've discussed this in this very wall, you know, protect the free flow of capital much better than they protect labor, mm -hmm. you know. And there is a progressive critique of globalization. We all know that. And that there were problems with TPP, just like we know there are problems with TTIP. So these problems haven't come from Trump. They've come from all, all sorts of, of different, you know, uh, uh, angles. Um, so we, we could also see this story as an iteration of, of an older story, too. Okay, let's go back to the audience um, and get some other questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, my question is um, about China and EU, Britain, um, post-Brexit Britain, let's say, and US. So China, obviously, there's a lack of trust in, in Trump, uh, specifically, yeah, and uh, trust. In lack of trust in Trump, and the Chinese embassy actually sent a team of experts overnight right after the election of Trump, and so we can see that there's a great deal of um, um, worry going on, and China is working quite hard to actually try to deal with um, companies in the UK and in, within the EU. So I would like to see how these four regions are going to work out together in terms of the trade and the relationship, and the other thing is to do with, of course, China now is kind of trying to position itself as the Zen version of <laughs> trade globalization leader. And so I wonder how Trump eventually or Putin will react to that or they will just ignore that bit 
and carry on with their old game. Thank you. Thanks. Question down front. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion. It's very enlightening. Um, I just have a question regarding um, the U.S.'s foreign policy agenda as it relates to um, Africa, particularly from the um, deal-making position, considering the fact that the African Growth and Opportunity Act, the GOA, is a preferential trade agreement, and um, it's not necessarily um, – for the benefit, it's more for the benefit of African countries than it is for the U.S. So under a Trump administration, considering um, I think a few days ago the New York Times um, reported that um, some of Trump's aides sent a, a letter to um, the state, U.S. State Department to ask what it is that they're losing um, to China and, and Africa. And so my question really is what will their agenda be um, from a deal-making perspective? Will it be like China, it, how in its engagement with Africa in terms of the deals with the extractive industries and infrastructure building? Or will it be um, good governance, you know, institution building in, in the continent? Thank you. Okay, and there was a question in the back there, on the back row, uh, up against the wall. Um, thanks. You've mentioned it briefly, but I'd be interested in hearing what, more about um, your thoughts on climate change global governance and how um, Rex Tillerson and Trump together might throw a span in the works of the Paris Agreement. Let's take one more. There was a hand right there beside the pillar. Yeah. You voiced some um, pretty serious concerns in that last discussion, and I just wondered, you know, reading widely, you get a sense that there's a bit of a prevailing, some prevailing anxiety around sort of re-emergence of conditions that gave rise to fascism in the early 20th century, you know, the sort of weakening or breakup of institutions for multilateral negotiation, a move towards mercantilist or protectionist or isolationist trade policy, an abandonment of human rights or move away from universal social services provision. So I just wondered what the pa how seriously the panel took those anxieties. Um, I, I, okay, let me get that question right next to you just because I want to get this voice in. Yes. I just want to uh, know your opinion on nuclear policy uh, and Trump's government, especially his t election manifesto. He uh, declared that uh, North and South Korea, North Korea nuclear nuclear uh, he will allow. Well, he, I, I just want to know your opinion on prediction of nuclear policy in this in his government. Okay, so there's a lot on the table while the panel is collecting its thoughts. Um, I'm hoping that um, in their responses they can also think about. Um, we, we tend to talk as social scientists and we think about um, institutions and international institutions and how they evolve, um, which is how we write our books and our articles, which makes them so long and, and some would say boring. Um, but uh, in, in the real world as it unfolds, uh, it, it tends to happen through a series of uh, crisis meetings that spin out of control or something happens or a boat sinks somewhere and maybe it was, was you know, uh, foul play. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to um, have this panel speculate a little bit, wildly as academics are not wont to do. Um, about how these particular mechanisms that you're talking about might actually come into play um, in the first couple of years of a Trump administration and where we're more or less likely to, to see them. So I leave that broadly to you. Um, Emily, why don't we start with you? Sure. I'd like to come back to this question on fascism. Um, and I think we need, to put the, we need to put Trump's election, I think, in the context of Brexit, the rise of populism in the EU, and rising inequality globally. Um, and to remember, I think Calypso has already made the point, that globalization has not served everybody. Um, and I think it's less a question of people having actually lost out in real terms. It's a relative question, right? We've seen the 1% sort of grow incredibly wealthy. Um, what was the statistic last week for Davos that Oxfam was eight people own 50%? Is that the right? Yeah. yeah? Like, that's astonishing. Um, and we've had, yes, we've had liberalization of the trade agenda. We don't have a global strong agreement on tax and the corp you know, cooperation to make sure that we can tax the 1%. Um, so in a way, we've sown the seeds of our own destruction, I think, um, and that failure for the, of the established order to respond to those concerns. We all knew they were coming. 
We knew inequality was rising. We knew unemployment in the north of England was going up. We both lost jobs in the 1980s. We failed to address it. Um, and yes, we've now got this rise in populism from the right, um, and we've got no answer from the left. And actually, that's what concerns me. It's the failure of the Labour Party in the UK, the failure of the Democratic Party in the US to really take this head on. And I don't think we've got easy answers, um, but I actually, more worryingly, don't think people are really doing the deep thinking. Okay, so the answer of the Labour Party in the UK has just been blame Corbyn, right? But it's not been to really provide a vision of actually what the future needs to look like and how we have a more equitable form of globalization. Um, so, and I don't think Trump's certainly not going not to give us the answers, but we need that count. We need the pushbacks. So we need the people on the streets. It's you know, good to hold the administration to account now, but where's the thinking, the sort of policy pushback, and the alternatives? We're still in, living in democracies, right, in, this, in the EU and the US. It's a dem they're democratic institutions. What's the alternative that people can vote for? Um, and, sort of, uh, and, and to see that um, come up. A little bit on the foreign policy in Africa. I was in a conference this morning on Africa and the extractive industry. Um, and it was interesting there because people have been very um, excited about the fact that we've had the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and it has brought some form of accountability. Um, not brilliant, but at least we've got some sort of traction on illicit financial flows in the extractive sector. And they said, you know, Trump's going to certainly not enforce that. And so there was an idea that this might be the golden age for corruption as it was sort of, uh, of US companies in Africa. So I think we might see neglect of Africa. Actually, I don't think it's going to be a big foreign policy priority. I think there's going to be kind of an, an inward turning of the, of the administration, with one exception, perhaps the military sort of ISIS in um, the sort of Sahelian belt, so Boko Haram, some of those concerns might sort of tr get the ear of the Trump administration. I don't think development's on their agenda and looking outwards and supporting growth um, in other parts of the world development. Um, so I think it's going to be less of a priority, and I think there's going to be some rolling back of some of the better things that we've seen. AGOA is an interesting one. So AGOA is the system of preferences that African countries can export to the U.S. market and not have to reciprocate. And the argument has always been that eventually that will be turned into a free trade agreement with Africa. It's unclear whether Trump will now pursue that route, given his distaste for a for tree, free, trade, free trade agreement. So um, I'm not so sure on that one. Let me okay. pass the floor back. Tom. Great. Let me talk about uh, the Chinese question that uh, what, what, uh, whether trust is possible um, as China with a new presence in global governance and the climate change question, and in doing so, touch on the nationalism question. Um, so first, I think we shouldn't any of us harbor any illusions of the liberalism of Xi Jinping or of the leadership of the People's Republic of China. Um, there's a lot of uh, deep reasons why China supports free trade, the free trade agreements it has. Um, it's a huge beneficiary of a global trading system and of the post-war security order that's accompanied its remarkable transformation over the past 30 years. So China's uh, ability to benefit from that system is hugely in question now, and that's, I think, why we've seen a strong rhetorical embrace uh, by the Chinese leader of Davos, rhetorically, but also uh, interestingly. It's also what the Chinese government tells itself it needs to do to affect the massive economic transformation it's now seeking to bring forward to liberalize its economy further, to shift uh, from an export um, investment-based economy to a consumer-led economy, innovation economy. So it's trying to do those things, and it's facing some very strong difficulties in making those reforms because it's difficult to um, overcome invested interests. And so the kind of international system is a useful um, empowerer of the reformists within domestic politics. Um, but Xi Jinping has presided over a, a closing of China in many ways, both politically and economically. Um, under, since he came to power, there's been a lot more difficulties that foreign corporations have had to operate in China that weren't there under Hu Jintao, for example. So um, I think it's very, uh, there's a long-term structural interest that China has in um, supporting effective global governance in key areas, um, but also some pretty uh, strong barriers and difficulties. And it's unclear whether um, Xi Jinping, who is, emerges as you know, the strongest leader in China, um, and in quite some time, is going to be the person who's able to um, resolve that balance in favor of global governance. Um, I think it's, it'll, it'll be easy to, and rightful for China to, to claim leadership in areas like trade and in climate change. It will receive diplomatic benefits from doing so. 
um, but also then face raised expectations from other parts of the world. So, you know, Xi Jinping and others have said that China will now be a, a global leader in climate change. In many ways, it's doing excellent things already. But that then invites all the other countries in the world, especially small island states, the developing world, who China often claims to speak for, to say, OK, you said you're a leader, now deliver. And so it's going to face increasing demands. Um, it's not clear to me that it will be able to meet those expectations. Um, although I, I think um, this is a case where leadership really matters, where choices people uh, in the Chinese leadership make could have very decisive effects um, going forward. Um, we've seen how the United States performed differently after World War I and World War II. And I would encourage any Chinese uh, leaders today to think about that experience and think what becoming a rising power and the responsibilities that come with it entail. Um, on climate change, let me strike a note of perhaps uncautious optimism, because I think we've heard a lot of interesting things here. Um, Donald Trump will delay the transition to a clean, low-carbon economy in the United States and globally, but he will not, in my view, stop it. Um, and that's because it's being driven forward by a huge number of decisions that are not taken in Washington, but are taken in many other parts of the real economy and other, other governments. So um, there will be some, I, I, can, I won't go into detail now, but there are several federal laws that help uh, drive the United States' transition away from fossil fuels. He will stop them, he'll delay them. It'll be a huge fight and lots of complicated things will take place. But as Cliff mentioned, the real decisions are, are made with a 10 or 15 or 20 year or 50 year time frame. And uh, those decisions are increasingly being driven by technological forces, um, by policies at the state level, at the city level, in other countries um, toward a, a low carbon way. So it, you know, that delay will be costly, um, but it, will, it won't be a thing that can actually undo um, our transition. And critically, it's something that actually the current system of the international regime is designed exactly to avoid. Um, the Paris Agreement, which was agreed about over, a little over a year ago, um, has a sort of bottom-up model, right, where one country's defection is not necessarily the thing that will undo other countries' cooperation. It's not, it's not built in the same way as previous climate change agreements to be dependent on that kind of um, collective action, universal collective action solution. It has a different logic that it, under which it operates. Um, we don't know if that'll work as quickly as we want it to work, um, but it seems likely that it'll be much more resilient in the face of these disruptions than other kinds of international treaties might be. So where does it leave us with nationalism? Well, I think, as Emily mentioned, you know, we, I think there's a very dangerous uh, dynamic of self-reinforcing dysfunction, if you want, where our inability to manage globalization well has a negative impact on real people and real places who then revolt against global forces by electing people who then make global governance work even worse, compounding the problem further. So unless we were somehow able to wave a magic wand and undo all the interdependence we now live in, um, we're going to need effective global governance to solve the challenges that are giving rise to the increasing populism and nationalism we see around the world. Um, and they're having exactly the opposite effect. So until we're able to kind of make sure that a global financial crisis doesn't take away um, people's houses and therefore make them very angry, um, we're going to be in this situation. So, you know, Emily mentioned the kind of need for a new vision, um, absolutely, in domestic politics, but also for the global level. We need these, the, the post-war system was dependent both on strong domestic institutions, strong uh, social democracies in the industrialized world, and an international order that allowed them to trade with each other in a prosperous way. That broke down and needs to be rebuilt. Great. Calypso. It needs to be rebuilt, but not the same way, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, so, way. and who invents the new way? And I think we want to be even more radical. I mean, I hear everything you both said and completely agree. And perhaps that's the problem with our panels. Because we're a bit too like-minded. Um, so next time we have to have, you know, whatever. Um, but if we think about, you know, our predicament uh, today and, and, and what needs to be done, the revolts, as it were, the insurgency in world politics and in domestic politics has to do with the combination of people being left behind and left out. Left behind economically, left out of politics. And in fact, it's the, old, it's the old question of the old left and the new left, because the old left was always about economic distribution of wealth. And the new left, for decades, you know, was saying, yeah, distribution of power matters, except that the new left kind of ended up, once it was in power, forgetting its message. Um, but I got in politics in the late 70s when I was in high school, and I, we were saying this at the time, and then you left. It's, it's about the voice, it's about the power, it's about how you feel you're part of the game. So, 
you, so if I think of the U.S. elections, you know, yesterday there was this really interesting um, documentary on Channel 4. I don't know if anyone saw it. You had these guys in the Rust Belt, you know, all dirty and full of coal and everything, and talking about their support for Trump. And the message was not, you know, we think he's our messiah and he's going to make us rich again. The message was more, we're going to bet on this guy because in a way we have no choice. It's, it's a choice like prospect theory. I, it's either a sure going with the li well-thinking liberals who are not going to do anything, Tina, they're going to, even Obama didn't, so that's sure, versus a bet. Probably he won't do much, but he could do something. Let's take the bet. In our despair, you're going to take the bet. Might not be rational, you know, in, in kind of our academic thinking, but that's how kind of people think when they're left out and left behind. And I think that's what we saw in Brexit too. It's not some sort of blind faith in whoever, Boris Johnson. So there is this question as to whether how the you know progressive whatever forces the new generations, you know, how we think about this. And I think part of it has to do with uh, the conversation, the democratic conversation. So-called progressive are, are still very complacent and in their bubble. So it's, it, there's no miracle solution, but th there has to be a conversation and listening and addressing people's concern. Now, on Trump then, we are a bit quick to say he can't really do much. And you were saying this, Emily, at the beginning. From well, trade, yeah. From trade. But, you know, there will be more subtle ways, I predict, of dealing with, say, companies. You know, one thing is border tariffs, and we, we explain how this is a bit difficult, uh, WTO and all the rest of it, and trade wars. And, but first of all, there, there, is corporate ta there are different types of taxation. There is domestic taxation. Moreover, you know, the executive can make life hard for companies that don't do the right thing. They can, you know, forbid a merger, or they can um, um, find ways. There are ways. <laughs> of pressuring companies and making linkages, et cetera. You know, um, Rob Hazza, my, my friend and colleague, has, has written about this. Um, so we'll see. But I think if people see that at least some administra the administration in the US is trying to do something, even though the trade route is going to be difficult, in, in a way that's good enough. I mean, I, and it, I'm playing devil's advocate, but I'm just kind of trying to say this. And, and the second point to make then is, is, is on this question of the triangle, you know, uh, uh, China, the EU, the U, uh, UK. Now, bargaining power in this world still matters. We're talking about institutions. But after all, when we teach hegemonic stability theory and what the US, what was the US bargaining power after the war? Was it the dollar? Was it, what was it? No, it was its big market. Your power in this interdependent world is to offer an open market. I think it's it maybe over-optimistic, but one can say the EU is better at that game than a Trump US, which will not be credible, back to Tom's point, if it says, oh, well, you know, you give us this and we open our market, because we, we know the trajectory is the opposite. Now, the EU is still in this game. In fact, people in Britain forget things like that this bargaining power is very useful to the UK. Who knows in this room the story of BT? When it went to China without the guarantees and started laying out its network, and the next thing you know, on some pretext, the Chinese authority confiscated the BT network. <laughs> BT had gone outside the EU because the EU had warned it, look, we, have, we don't have an agreement on this yet, don't go. So they went crying to Brussels, saying, we did the bad thing, please help us now. And indeed, actually, Brussels put enough pressure and used its market power to get something out of it, some compensation wouldn't have gotten it without the EU. And as you were saying earlier, Emily, there are things like this that the Brexit UK is going to learn very quickly. Uh, and how compatible would that be with deals with Trump is, is a very, very big question mark. And you were saying, Emily, on the Africa front, uh, on, on AGOA, and I was wondering and, um, on whether Trump's obsession with this, as I was mentioning at the very beginning, the asymmetric, like that's one of our, their favorite world, you know, as if like, there wasn't a huge asymmetry in power of power in this world. Well, no, but they're un, unhappy with all these asymmetric deals. How are these asymmetric, fairly asymmetric deal with developing countries going to fare in this philosophy, you know? How are they going to 
look at these deals, I mean, is kind of a way of re-asking the same question that, that you asked. Great. So I'm going to ask the audience for one more round of questions. But um, I'm actually, I, I think Calypso has made a very deep point about uh, the lack of diversity on, on this panel in terms of ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'd like oh. to put an alternative um, version. Uh, and the, the version of global governance that I want to put on the table that Trump might bring us is um, the, the, the Trump may attempt to re-embed liberalism properly understood. Uh, and that is to say, um, Trump and May um, have enunciated a view of the nation state as still having a role, as membership in the nation state still having a role. There are disaffected voters of both the left and the right. The conventional left and the right are sort of categories in flux. Um, and Trump and May have in different ways, Theresa May, have responded to Theresa May and her conservative party. Uh, Theresa May, of course, in her conservative party, which now has lots of space to play with, given the movement of the Labor Party, um, in terms of what space they want to occupy. They've both seen um, this uh, yearning, which some of us find uncomfortable. Um, I I'm an immigrant in this country, and so I find it particularly uncomfortable, because one of the characteristics of um, this movement is we want to prioritize nationals. Uh, you know, um, we may not be the best educated, but we are members of this community, and membership of this community should mean something. Um, and this is a sense of national community, which some worry about as being a sort of a new road to fascism, but others could say it's a revitalization of the nation state, which the left has been p too pusillanimous uh, to allow to happen, um, and a new, muscular, free-thinking, largely right-wing um, uh, set of government could do it. And in fact, um, what you'll have uh, in, in Brexit uh, and in Trump is um, models for what um, new freedom with international trade can look like. That is to say, we'll have international trade, but we'll have um, uh, uh, borders that are a little bit more secure as far as people are concerned. That is to say, people get a lot more harassed when they, when they enter and leave countries, but that there's, there's a net lowering of immigration. Um, and that possibility may be one that actually um, ultimately would have the impact that people of the left and people in Davos are so worried about, which is to say um, the rising tide against globalization. And it may be that Davos has no answer to um, the rising tide against globalization, and Trump and, and Brexit may. And that is to say, to put a lid on it, um, and particularly to make some policies that people are uncomfortable with about immigration. And so the new global governance model introduced may well be something like this, which um, is then exported around uh, as, as, as a new model to uh, understand how nation states fit together. I throw that on the table to entertain a conversation. Um, other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I'd be interested in hearing the panel's view on how a country as, in quotes, great as the United States got itself into this situation where its people had the invidious choice between a Democratic Party who has been identified as not being able to do anything or not willing to do anything and another part, the opposite party uh, being characterized as a rank punt. How did they get into this mess? Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Um, Microphone coming. Oh, um, we had comments from the panel saying that the vision, what's missing is a vision from the left in contradiction to what we're seeing, the populism of the right. If the populism of the right is based on the nation state, isn't it up to the vision of the left to go back, whatever, workers of the world, I mean, the international, all this sort of, that the nation state is really in economically um, an illusion in terms of, and that, that to actually sort of ghost or to follow the, the, the right in saying, yes, we must have a Theresa May type of nationals is really not going to do them much good because you're always going to have the right going to be stronger on, on, on the national front. It really is to, to downplay this national stuff, to actually challenge it and to say we are all better off from, from an international model. And that is what's lost. I mean, that, that Hillary Clinton even herself rejected the, the, the TPP and on sort of nationalist American grounds, whereas instead of explaining, you know, as, as Obama and, and, and her husband had done over, over previous rounds as to why, you know, international, we're bringing everybody up. This is not a zero-sum game. I mean, that the, the, the left has lost this, this element of, of, of rejecting this sort of national autism, or autarkiziki, which we are getting into. Mm -hmm. Do you feel on that? Great. We've got a, a question right here. 
Um, given that it sort of seems that the U.S. administration's trade policy now is sort of uh, to extract as much benefit from bilateral deals as possible, um, how effective do you think it will be in negotiating that with, with other countries? And sort of further from that, if it's not effective and it ends up in a tit-for-tat situation, does the administration really care if it's tit-for-tat? Are they actually scared of reciprocation? Or, uh, because they, they don't seem particularly concerned with the actual results of a lot of things. So as long as they can play it down and they have an international boogeyman, does that sort of reduce the, the fear that they have for retaliation? There was a question right next to you. Let's just there you perfect. Um, with, yeah. with the left-right divide that we're all conceptualizing of, I know that the economists have started to say that it's open versus closed, because you had both Hillary Clinton going against the TPP, as well as Bernie Sanders saying that it was a Koch brother policy to have open borders. Is there just needing to be a domestic reconceptualization of political parties in order for global governance to work in an open way that we all think is positive? And do you think that maybe all of the, like global governance is going to need a necessary restructuring of political parties at the domestic level to have a future. Interesting, yeah. Any final questions from the audience? Yes. I suppose to take up on, uh, on, uh, on Pepper's uh, very interesting point, uh, could one not see um, uh, Trump uh, and Brexit indeed being about, very essentially about free trade, but free trade and fair trade, where the emphasis is on uh, getting rid of certain tariffs that some countries undoubtedly have, such as China, getting rid of or doing something about uh, undervalued uh, currencies, which some countries get real advantages from, again China, but I'd also add in uh, Germany there, I think, with the euro. And indeed, doing something also about uh, corporate taxes and uh, equalizing corporate taxes across countries. And really, the, uh, the sort of felt uh, uh, need is for free trade and fair trade. All right. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back to the panel for instead of concluding uh, remarks from each. Um, and while they collect their thoughts, I'll, I'll um, take chair's privilege and, and, and put out one response to this question about the uh, American polity. Um, I, one, I'm a comparative political scientist, so I should have a thought. And two, I, I'm American. So um, um, the, the, the problem of uh, how the left and the right got stuck with this choice is one that's, that's going right around the rich countries. Um, and it's, it's, it's very striking in uh, the United States context how, how the United States wound up with Trump. Um, because you had a bunch of different currents in the Republican Party uh, represented in the primary, and none of them was able to create um, a, a sort of uh, a coalition behind it. And so one can attribute this to a, you know, a particularly poor class of, of leaders, and, and many people have. But I think that's not seeing the forest for the trees. Um, what, what, what that means is that none of those particular re leaders had a compelling set of ideas to bring together um, uh, the, the big coalition that you need in American parties uh, of the right. Right. Um, and similarly, um, the, on the, the, the left, there was uh, a clear separation uh, in the um, Democratic Party between those who were behind Sanders and those who were behind Clinton. Um, and Clinton did not evoke a lot of enthusiasm among many of the sort of more centrist voters who might in the past have voted um, a Democrat. Now, so that left a, a, a sort of unique situation where Trump was able to, to, to win, according to the uh, U.S. electoral rules. Um, but it's a situation that's going to be repeated, I think, throughout the industrial countries with, with uh, different institutional permutations because different places have different rules. Um, what's going on um, is that many of the compromises that, that have been discussed here um, are uh, you know, under threat and, and new possibilities are emerging. And social, uh, you know, social movements are happening and political parties are responding. And some of them are responding slowly. Uh, and many of those parties that we, that we talk about a lot now are not going to be the same in 15 or 20 years. So um, it's a very exciting time for parties, but it's a terrible time to be a party leader. And that's true in the United States, and that's true elsewhere. So um, I think we'll go in the um, – well, let's go in reverse order. So we'll get, we'll get Emily, Tom, and give Calypso the last word. Great. Thank you very much. Some great questions there. Pepper, I think 
On the question of Trump and May, yes, they are similar in some respects, notably on immigration. They're not similar on the trade one, right? I mean, there's a huge difference. Trump is there putting up every barrier he can. Theresa May is touting us as sort of a new free trade um, Britain and low barriers, right? So that's a really important difference, and it actually plays out in this question of will we get deals. So the, the challenge for Trump is what is he going to offer in any... Right? Is he offering opening up markets? You know, the America in every trade deal it's done, it says, yeah, you know, it's been, they've been asymmetric deals, but it has made some concessions to, its, to others in order to get them to the table to sign a deal. Is Trump, what's Trump going to put on the table? And that's not immediately clear to me because he's not prepared to open up markets. So um, th that's going to be tough for him. But equally for Theresa May, right? So she went to India and she said, look, we want a trade deal. And they said, well, yeah, that's great. Can we have access for highly skilled Indians into the UK economy? And, guess what? She's not, she's not able to do that. So I think we've sort of, if we're not careful, we sort of think of trade as trading goods and services. Actually, it also means skilled people and ideas, right? And that's what the South wants. Um, so it's not clear that either of them can deliver on the kind of bilateral trade agenda um, and that that can come together. Um, on the question of sort of openness, yes, I think the left does need to champion an international vision, but I don't think it can be the status quo worked fine and we just need to keep go back to that. Um, we need a new vision of international cooperation that actually addresses inequality and redistribution. And that's the bit the left really didn't ever want to touch, right? It didn't really want to touch and push that hard on international tax cooperation um, and some of those agendas. And I think unless we do, we can't bring the population along with us. Do, equally, within the domestic circles, and we do need both levels, I agree with Tom on this, we need a sort of international vision and a domestic one, H what jobs are we going to create in the modern world for relatively low-skilled low workers in OECD countries? Right? That's actually quite tough when you've got, you know, the, you've got China with much lower wages or Mexico on your border. We can't just keep, you know, the welfare state is under threat. But even just, even if it wasn't, you, we, you can't just sort of give people handouts. That's not a way to sustain um, people's livelihoods. It's not, you know, you can't aspire in the north of Britain um, to sort of be living on welfare, however generous that is. So I actually think there's some quite important thinking, both on sort of international vision we need to sell, but also on just the industrial policy and what that looks like, particularly for the low-end um, skill set. Um, and perhaps, perhaps I'll leave it there. But I think. Um, I'm actually quite optimistic, believe it or not, given all the comments I've made. Um, but I think someone put it to me yesterday that in, a, in certainly in my generation, I didn't live through Vietnam, right? I didn't really live through the kind of apartheid, apartheid era of the 1980s. Um, it's been kind of centrist politics for a long time. Um, and actually, for the first time, a lot of what I believe in is really being put under scrutiny. Um, and that's no bad thing in the sense of actually getting us to have to articulate and fight for what we, what we believe in. I think we've been quite comfortable for a long time, and those of us on the sort of, I put myself on the sort of left spectrum, those values, we need to really sit up and, and defend them and articulate them and, and, and sell them and, and come up with a new vision that is much more, um, much more just. So, yeah, it's a, it's a huge sort of moment in the global economy, but one to which I think we, we can and should prepare ourselves to respond um, and hey, 20 years out, maybe we'll have a much more equal um, distribution of global goods. We'll be able to solve climate change. And actually, this will be our moment of wake up that the sta status quo wasn't working. And some of these moments are, are here to challenge us. And let's rise to that challenge. Great. Thank you. Tom. Well, here, here to the rising to the challenge. And I, I strongly um, I feel in many ways the same way as Emily on this. Um, but I want to come back to this question of um, of nationalism and how we treat this broader trend. Um, I think two points I want to make. First, I think we often forget how the nation state can in many ways be seen as the most progressive invention of human history in lots of ways. And the nation state was a tool for uh, democratization. It was a tool for social and wealth redistribution. It's a tool for national self-determination against imperialism. Um, it's often been used for extremely progressive ends. And in fact, the world we have here today, um, all the benefits we've enjoyed of um, our comfortable lives, as Emily put it, um, you know, largely derived from having strong functioning nation states. And woe be to those places that don't have strong functioning nation states, because those are the unhappiest places in the world. Um, but I think ironically, and this is my second point, um, you know, in politics it's not physics, but there, are, there is an idea that actions provoke reactions, and sometimes they're equal and opposite in, in compensating. Um, so, you know, in the post-war order, we built this 
nation-state-based version of globalization, where we had a kind of embedded liberalism um, that was functional and brought great wealth to at least the, the industrialized democracies. Um, that then accelerated interdependence in ways that reached beyond our kind of institutional technology to control. Like the problems got harder, interdependence deepened, we suddenly realized new countries benefited from the system and, and rose up, and so we had a more heterogeneous, multipolar world. All, all good things, but then result in these second order problems that are now, I think, really difficult for us to solve, that our existing institutional technology this was never designed to, to manage. And I think that's the moment we're in now, of having to think of these new solutions um, that manage this problem. Um, and the uh, as Emily says, that's a, a great challenge, but also an interesting and exciting sometimes opportunity. Because as I was mentioning climate change, we actually have a new way of attacking this problem that is going, you know, providing some really interesting results, results we wouldn't have even dreamed of five years ago, um, a new way of organizing. Um, and I think that corresponds in many ways to the way, um, if I can put it slightly more sharply than you did, Emily, a generational divide on many of these questions that we've seen in, in our democracies, especially. Um, you know, Trump did not win a majority of American votes, but he won a much smaller majority of young Americans' votes. The Brexit referendum um, you know, won a plurality of, of British people's votes, but not uh, you know, close to anywhere near a majority of the young people's votes. People aren't as nationalist as you think. Um, and this is my point about actions and reactions. Maybe the rise of nationalism is exactly a reaction to the progress the world has made in including different kinds of people into our societies in different ways. In the United States, it takes on a racial tone in many ways, a reaction to the world's first, the nation's first black president. Um, in, uh, in this country, maybe it's reflected different in other demographic patterns. Um, but I think we can't you know, ignore the idea that the future may yet be, be bright, um, the, uh, to paraphrase, um, a president leaving office today who is quoting another American leader, you know, the arc of history may bend lots of ways, <laughs> lots of different directions, but it does ultimately go in, in an upward trajectory. And that's a kind of optimistic note I'd like to at least have in my mind over the next four years. Okay, Calypso. Indeed. You get the final word. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I mean, I think part of what we're saying to Charles and, and to this whole question is that uh, it, it would be granting victory to the xenophobes of this world, those who like othering and exclude the others, to, to mix up the, the, uh, a grounded critique of globalization with xenophobia and othering. So the first thing I think that, you know, common theme, as it were, is very much to distinguish those two. Now, sometimes they overlap, absolutely, uh, but not in a majority of cases. So I think that's the, the first point. So if that's the if that's true, then what Pepper got us started on is that perhaps we can all agree on the critique of disembedded liberalism. Tom just ran us through this. And, and that's above all, you know, finance. And, and somehow, you know, embedded liberalism was all about, at the end of the day, it's people's lives that matter. Wherever they are, you know, it, liberalism has to be embedded and there should be a priority. And the priority is people's life, not the big principle of free X and free Y, free capital movement, free trade. These are instruments. They're, it's functionalism. They're, we do that for a reason. They're not end in themselves. The end in themselves is, is people's dignity and welfare and basic needs and all the rest of it. That's embedded liberalism, right? So we've seen a period of disembedded liberalism, two decades at least, uh, with the great you know, tri triumph of the end of history. And talking about arc of history, and a lot of intellectuals and politicians, many have criticized this embedded liberalism. So now it's kind of room emerge into, into politics in a very big way. And the question in who, who does anyone have the monopoly on interpreting on how we re-embed liberalism, as it were? And, you know, Tom made, just made a brilliant defense of the nation state as your first port of call the right nation state. So the question becomes which nation, we have here a wonderful philosopher, David Miller at DPIR, who's written beautifully about this. Nation state, at the end of the day, maybe we can't have global solidarity. It's the first space of solidarity, as it were, of, of, with strangers, with people you don't know. Right? But it's not a blanket, we're, we're not giving a blanket approval to the nation state as as a, a unit that is still necessary to create solidarity and fairness in societies, then we have to ask, well, which kind of nation state? 
And that's the kind of what agenda, and Roderick and others have, you know, made this point very, very clear a long time ago, you know, the right condemnation state, the global, uh, globalizing state is a state that has enough welfare to cushion the, 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 the hardships of globalization to redistribute gains as well as losses, etc. So it's, this is the story of Theresa May build, and the British government failing to build hospital places and, and schools when immigrants come in. That's the role of the state. But I think what Emily was, uh, was and you know, we can in, reinvent there, and there's a very, fun, very interesting debates on universal income, for instance. Uh, you know, and th this will happen. In 20 years' time, we will have a universal income. How high, who, how, there are many questions, but we will. We will have an agenda of what, you know, the progressive, the left calls pre-distribution. Very important. Back to all the ideas of equalities of opportunity, uh, you know, and what people call pre-distribution, but before we think of redistributing through wealth, how do we make people capable of generating wealth in what environment, etc.? And that's true nationally, but then globally. Emily was talking about, you know, what the Global South does. Well, you know, to, to Charles, I mean, after all, the Global South did try to say, you know, workers of all countries unite. There was a, the whole bargain in the 90s was to ask, are we going to give as much right to global labor as to global capital? That was, you know, Emily's point about India, but it's a much more global point. And if we look at global deals, now why is it that it's always free movement of good corporations, capital, but never, you know, the global immigration regime or, or that alone refugees, etc. But even people who move from the South to provide services, I mean, all of these things. There's a huge global asymmetry between rights of capital and rights of labor. And we need to face that. Um, even for Keynesian reasons, for the global economy to work, you have to have global demand. And if you continue to exploit people in Bangladesh, you're not going to have global demand. And I know, Charles, you work on this, you know, um, uh, out there in the Bretton Woods Institution. So finally, I would, I would, I would end then by saying, if we care about, you know, what ha the new bargains in the domestic level, in the new bargains at the global level, I mean, I think what we've all been saying in different ways is this, these need to be, and how do you go about this? Partly, you know, it's the new technology, it's distributed intelligence, it's people participating and inventing on the, on the, on the global web, and that's what you all know to do in the room, you know, much better than me. Partly it's what Catherine was raising. At the end of the day, good old parties, you know, who channels the, the voice and the thinking, um, wonderful political scientist who died recently, Charles Mayer, talked about governing the void. We have a society, a global society, where people retreat in their private sphere, governments and elites retreat in their bubbles, wherever they are, in Westminster or Washington or Brussels. And what connects those worlds? In part, that's what we're talking about. What connects those worlds? Where movements, parties, not just social media, and, and there is a lot to be done there. I, I, I very much hope that this good old notion of engagement and conversation and political struggles, you know, comes back to the fore. But that it's not just about short-term struggle, and I want to end with this. I mean, I think perhaps one of the promise of our age is to move from the politics of space, where you exclude, you create boundaries, you, you close little boxes, to the politics of time. And this is really Tom's point about intergenerational. You know, we need to have politics that allow us to work for the long term, to um, safeguard, you know, the environment, but also our financial structures, our, our imaginations for the long term. And, and international organization, all the way back to global governance, they can do that for paradoxical reasons that they're not democratic or not very democratic. Democracy, as Tocqueville told us, is a short-term game. And... Global governance, for being non-democratic, that might be the silver lining. Global governance, European governance, can be better guardians of the long term, at least if we push them to do that. Okay, Calypso, thank you. So, will a new U.S. foreign policy change global governance? In an hour and 20 minutes, we are going to find out. But um, I'd like to thank are the we? panel for giving us a sneak preview of what this new world might look like. Um, please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>